series on how treatment guidelines are being used to conduct uh, an experiment on not only the American public, but the international public uh, with respect to Lyme disease. This talk is going to talk more about the agenda of uh, how this, what I call it, a synthetic epidemic ties in with a uh, vaccine marketing strategy, uh, which was outlined in a CDC paper, which I'm going to cover. We're coming out this morning, and I want to thank Sue for having me back at the uh, Physicians Roundtable. I assume everybody can hear me okay. Um, this is the third in my series on how treatment guidelines are being used to conduct uh, an experiment on not only the American public, but the international public uh, with respect to Lyme disease. This talk is going to talk more about the agenda of uh, how this, what I call a synthetic epidemic, ties in with a uh, vaccine marketing strategy, uh, which was outlined in the CDC paper, which I'm going to cover. Um, this is the vaccine marketing agenda behind the so-called steer camp of Lyme disease treatment. And Alan Steer, as most of you know, is the uh, alleged expert on Lyme disease. And it's the steer camp that is dictating how patients can or cannot be treated for Lyme disease. Okay, so this is an overview of the talk. Uh, I'm going to give just an overview of the status of the epidemic. Um, I'm going to go over the curious disease distribution and uh, discuss whether it's through incompetence or design. And uh, I'm going to go through the uh, little bit of the history of the steer camp, uh, creating a treatment denial situation, the history of false information that they've spread, and the institutionalization of uh, corruptions through the treatment guidelines. And then that's going to tie into the uh, vaccine marketing agenda, uh, which is basically run by the pharmaceuticals industry. And again, I'm going to go over this blueprint article, which outlines the strategy that I think they're employing, uh, which I think explains the decades of incompetence and corruption. A little bit about me, um, I'm actually an industrial physicist, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I've been in the private industry for over 25 years as an engineer, uh, both in the microelectronics industry and now in the micro-optics industry. I'm also the author of three books on unethical medical experimentation, you can look them up online. Um, I'm also a tick-borne disease victim, was bit by a tick in North Carolina, and was fortunate enough to have a world-class expert in my town. Um, and I recovered under long-term antibiotics treatment. Uh, my doctor was eventually put out of business by the North Carolina, North Carolina Medical Boards. Um, but I continued under his care uh, in other states and also through uh, some unconventional means and I'm pretty much fully recovered now. Um, but anyway, this long-term treatment, which is necessary for a lot of Lyme patients, is under full-scale assault by uh, profit-oriented interests using what I call a third-party strategy, which gives them the appearance of working under scientific consensus, which is not, and it's uh, actually all carried out through the National Security Infrastructure for Protection. Okay, uh, again, and I covered a lot of what I want to say in my uh, presentation last year. You can Google uh, my name, Jerry Leonard, connecting the dots if you want the full presentation. I'm just going to give up some highlights today and get more into the uh, vaccine marketing aspect of the disease. Um, but last year, I went over some of the links between Lyme disease and biowarfare, just real quickly. Um, these are some of the connections between uh, Lyme disease and various either biowarfare researchers or biowarfare epidemiologists. For example, the name of the illness, Lyme, Connecticut, is directly across from Plum Island, which is uh, a biowarfare lab that did tick research uh, off the coast of Long Island. Uh, the namesake of the Lyme pathogen is named after Little Bird Gopher, who's a uh, biowarfare researcher. And the namesake of the culturing medium uh, was, is Alan Barber, who invented it at a biowarfare lab. He now directs a biowarfare lab. Uh, the namesake of the School of Treatment Denial, Alan Steer, so called Steer Camp, he's the CDC biowarfare officer in the uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service. Uh, the lead author of the foremost study used to justify the Steer Camp of Treatment Denial uh, is named Mark Plumier. And uh, he directs a biowarfare lab and the lead author of the treatment guidelines themselves, which are used uh, to deny Lyme victims treatment, uh, is Gary Warnes, who lectures on biowarfare. So two of these individuals above are actually biowarfare lab directors, as I mentioned, Alan Barber and Mark Klettner, and three of them have actually led the Lyme vaccine efforts, Alan Barber, Alice Steer, and Gary Warnes. So if Lyme disease is hard to catch and easy to cure, Situation: Why are there so many biowarfare experts involved? Obviously, it's not hard. It's not easy to cure. It's hard, very hard to cure. Uh, 
So it's just an update on the epidemic. Uh, this is a Wikipedia article stating that Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disease in the Northern Hemisphere. And the epidemic is now raging out of control. This is an article uh, just from a month ago to today, I think, saying that this is the worst summer yet for Lyme disease. This is mid-page today. Uh, there, within the last year or so, there have been numerous uh, emergency Lyme disease task forces uh, in various states, Virginia and Massachusetts, um, towns like Ridgefield, Connecticut, counties, uh, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. These are links. I'm going to have this presentation on the uh, internet. After the presentation, you can look these up. Um, we have an epidemic of deer ticks closing down campsites in Cape Cod. We have tick alerts being given in Maryland. And even as far south as Texas, we have, uh, in this report, about a quarter of the ticks found in Texas have Lyme disease, which is outrageous. Um, and again, this is a key phrase. Most doctors will say there's no Lyme disease in Texas. This is the theme repeated over and over again. We have this epidemic raging, but the doctors are being told that there's no Lyme disease in their state. So the question is, where are these doctors getting their information, and why is this information continually proven wrong with no repercussions? And it is continually proven wrong. This is in the UK. Um, it's an article stating that the ticks that can transmit Lyme disease may be more prevalent in the UK than realized. Um, can be transmitted through the dog ticks. And experts suspect the problem is even bigger. Um, I don't state North Carolina retractions with respect to Lyme disease that the ticks actually can. Uh, carry Lyme disease in North Carolina. This is an article I showed last year uh, in the Raleigh News Observer. State affirms Lyme disease danger. States, after years of cautioning that people were unlikely to get Lyme disease in North Carolina, state health leaders are now advising that tick-borne illness can in fact be acquired here. Uh, that's where I caught it. And this is uh, another story of a mother trying to get treatment for her children, and she says even when the Lyme disease, even when the Lyme test came back positive the doctors still question the diagnosis. So uh, it's very difficult to get treated. And even if you get a positive test, the doctors are filled with false information that they may not even treat you. So the question is, why did they deny the obvious for so long, causing suffering for countless patients like me and doctors like mine, who was eventually put out of business in North Carolina? Well, the problem is these so-called health leaders, and a lot of them are coordinating policy with uh, a group within the CDC called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which is a bio-defense group, and they're the seat of the problem because they're actually helping to uh, perpetuate the epidemic under the pretext of treating it. Again, this is in the UK, just showing that the Lyme disease epidemic is international. This is the number of disease cases in uh, England and Wales has almost tripled since 2002, so that's 10 years. And back to uh, the United States, this is a SUNY professor stating that Lyme disease is diagnosed by physicians uh, at rates that may be 10 to 50 times higher than what the public health statistics show. So think about that. 10 to 50 times higher than what the officials are admitting. So I ask, are the public health statistics deliberately underplaying the epidemic? I believe they are. This is an article from British Columbia uh, stating that the, uh, the officials are failing to inform the public massively stating that they failed to properly disclose at least two pieces of critical information about particular Lyme disease. And it was a particular study that showed the cases may be up to 25 times more numerous than the official estimates. So again, 25 times more numerous than the previous official estimates. Something major is going on here. So I think not only are the public health statistics being deliberately underplayed, but the epidemic is largely the result of public health policy. So I believe Lyme disease is a politically created epidemic, largely, and it's actually being perpetuated by the very agencies who should be stopping it, but they have a hidden agenda. And I call this the contrived epidemic spiraling out of control. I have a website which has a presentation on this, uh, of this very title. Uh, hundreds of thousands of patients a year are being allowed to contract a physically disabling and mentally incapacitating disease. And the complexity of the disease and its contagious nature is being hidden from them and the doctors, allowing the disease to spread. And the treatment denial for the disease is actually coordinated at a very high level. And the spread of the disease, which results, is consistent with a vaccine development strategy and a marketing strategy outlined in the CDC paper, which I'm going to go over extensively in a second half. So I think this is the blueprint for the so-called steer camp of Lyme disease treatment. Uh, the article is called The Cost Effectiveness of Vaccination Against Lyme Disease, and this is actually a CDC publication. And the lead author, Martin 
Meltzer is actually, I believe, the CDC, or an EIS officer. He's given presentations at EIS conferences and he's written on uh, biological warfare. So if a vaccine against Lyme is expensive and has a very low probability of actually working, has major side effects, and requires multiple shots over periods of months or years, how do you make such a vaccine look cost effective? Well, the question is, cost effective compared to what? If you make the alternative an untreated epidemic from a complex illness with a horrific array of debilitating and deadly symptoms, um, you can make just about any vaccine look cost effective. So this talk will address exactly why and how this is being done. Basically, if you control the definition of the disease, you can control how it is or is not treated, and you can make a lot of money. So I claim that the CDC is actually coordinating with the pharmaceuticals industry to deny patients treatment. I want to go over a precedent for how this has been done in the past. Of course, this is the infamous Tuskegee experiment, which went on for over 40 years. Uh, this is a statement by Dr. Colin Ross, who says that this experiment establishes that a large network of doctors and organizations are willing to participate in, fund, and condone grossly unethical medical experimentation into the settings. And curiously, just as the uh, Tuskegee experiment was being shut down in the early 70s, the Lyme epidemic began raging. So this is a recent article about the Tuskegee experiment. It was actually an international experiment, and they were actually not only denying treatment, they were injecting people with syphilis. Um, and this is a New York Times article stating that the highest medical and legal officials in the American government and experts at Harvard and other top med schools actually approved these disease experiments. They state that the ethical errors were made by a startling array of public health luminaries, the Surgeon General, the Attorney General, Army and Navy officials, the President of the American Medical Association, the President of the National Academy of Sciences, and experts at Harvard, Johns Hopkins, etc. So it shows that top officials of government, health, legal, scientific, and military agencies, in conjunction with private medical societies and top academic institutions, colluded in an experiment to make people sick. I believe this is still going on with respect to Lyme disease. They actually published uh, the results of their study over a period of decades. This is one of the articles. They actually plotted the life expectancy of uh, people that were victims of treatment denial and, and described how the uh, Life, of, life expectancy in the syphilitic group uh, was actually reduced and they, they plotted the results. Um, they even stated, uh, so far we are keeping the known positive patients from getting treatment. So they were proud of what they were doing. So the rationale for all this is uh, point number two. If you have a chronic disease, uh, such as syphilis or Lyme disease, this necessitates a long-term study of the natural history of the disease before the effectiveness of programs for the control of the disease can be evaluated. So you need to understand what the disease can do untreated before you can really determine if your treatments are effective. And if it's a chronic, a chronic disease like syphilis or Lyme, then you have to do that over a long period of time. And that's what they did. So they've actually done uh, experiments like the syphilis experiments long before Tuskegee started. This is uh, from the 1800s. Doctors were injecting people with syphilis as part of the vaccine agenda. And I believe these experiments are still going on. This is a quote by Edmund Burke. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So I'm trying to give you a little history here so we can hopefully prevent this experiment from going on. Again, this is how I believe the uh, Tuskegee experiment called Phase 2 is going on. This is in my presentation from last year. I'm not going to go over this this year, but you, this is on YouTube. You can look it up. Just Google connecting the dots under my name. So the uh, Lyme and syphilis disease agents are actually very similar. This is an article that states the uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is amazingly similar to the spirochete that causes syphilis. This is the Wikipedia article which is showing uh, that under the spirochete label, uh, the spirochete that causes syphilis and Lyme are very closely related. And they both cause uh, three-phase infections uh, starting out with skin diseases and you can end up with neurological problems. So how is this being carried out? Tuskegee phase one, patients were isolated. They were kept from seeing doctors outside of the experimental system that the, uh, that the public health service had set up. I believe Tuskegee phase two is being conducted by keeping doctors from treating patients outside of so-called treatment guidelines. Uh, so go into a little more about the, uh, how the epidemic is raging. So we have this massive tick infestation and this Lyme epidemic raging in the northeast of the United States. Um, so is there a war on the ticks? 
No, there's actually a war on the doctors who treat diseases that the tricks are spread, spreading. This is an article from the uh, Poughkeepsie Journal. Does anybody to keep me up with this series? It's a really fantastic series. Uh, actually, one of the only newspapers in the country reporting accurate information on the Lyme disease epidemic. So they state that uh, the prime target is not an army of ticks. In the bullseye is a handful of doctors, specifically those who dispense long-term antibiotics for the illness, uh, which is required in a lot of cases. For example, that's what got me better. And they state at least five doctors in Dutchess County are under investigation by state life licensing officials. It's the state officials that are doing the dirty work in the pharmaceutical industry. This is an article I showed last year. This is from the Roanoke Times, stating that upwards of 30 doctors, most of them in the Lyme Riddle, northeastern states, have been sanctioned in the past decade. So, as a result of all this, um, there are very few physicians that want to treat Lyme disease. They don't want to be put out of business. Um, this is an article stating that among almost 300 primary care physicians in Connecticut, which is ground zero for the Lyme disease, only 2% are willing to treat chronic Lyme. So this is a public health disaster. So why is this happening? Basically, I believe it's a marketing strategy on the part of the ph pharmaceuticals industry. They're bullying doctors, which is an ongoing trend through treatment guidelines, which is a new manifestation. This is an article uh, published by the Australian that showed that the pharmaceuticals company uh, actually drew up a hit, a hit list of doctors that they wanted to get rid of because they were a threat to their profits. They had, had to be neutralized or discredited because they criticized the drug that the pharmaceutical company was selling. The uh, drug firms also bully and investigate the FDA officials, the ones that aren't bribed into compliance. Uh, they have numerous ways of swaying uh, doctor prescriptions to make money, and it's working. This is an article showing that, for example, antidepressants, uh, the use has skyrocketed over 400% in the past 20 years, and they're prescribing uh, antipsychotics in nursing homes, uh, jails, children in foster care are getting three and four drugs simultaneously admitted administered to them. Uh, younger and younger children are given antipsychotics, and now they're even so-called pre-drugging the kids because they look like they might have uh, psychotic illness, psychosis risk, risk syndrome is what they're calling it. And now they're even giving babies drugs in the womb, believe it or not. So all the pharmaceuticals companies have to do is figure out how to treat dead people and they'll have the market order. Um, this is a case where they actually had a SWAT team assault a mother who was trying to protect her child from getting treated with uh, antipsychotics. Anybody familiar with this case? The mother actually had off the SWAT team with a pistol because she didn't want to administer uh, antipsychotics to her daughter, and her doctor had told her not to. Um, she eventually was taken to jail, and she was eventually vindicated. This is a very interesting story. Uh, Mike Adams has covered it in Natural News. Uh, Mike Adams is, is a great source of information if you guys aren't familiar with it. I would get on his news list. It's called Natural News. Mike Adams. Just a quick survey of how powerful the pharmaceuticals industry uh, routinely paying billion dollar fines, and they just pay it because they make more money uh, selling drugs. They can recoup the cost uh, with their profits. And treatment guidelines are just another way of dictating uh, profits and bullying doctors. This is a recent article called Guidelines. Guides to Profit, which explains how financial relationships have corrupted the whole guideline process. This is an article I showed last year that showed that these treatment guidelines, even though they're becoming more and more prevalent, um, they're based largely on so-called level three evidence, which is opinion, which makes them very dangerous. This article states that uh, physicians should remain very cautious when using treatment guidelines as the sole source of patient care, but unfortunately a lot of them do because we put out of business in a lot of cases if they don't. And this is another article which I showed last year showing that uh, compliance with treatment guidelines may actually be fatal. It may actually uh, do more damage to the patients than if you did treat them according to the treatment guidelines. So apply this to Lyme disease. This is the infamous uh, Attorney General Blumenthal's investigation of the IDSA treatment guidelines for Lyme disease. He found that the, uh, the process in which they were drafted was riddled with corruption. Um, he, they were forced to uh, revisit their guidelines, but they, uh, they held a hearing and they ended up not changing anything. So they just went on business, business as usual with these guidelines that are keeping thousands and thousands of people sick. So this is all due to what's called the Steer Camp of Lyme Disease Treatment. Uh, this is Alan Steer. This is a Wikipedia article just showing the so-called Lyme Disease Controversy. 
steer support for the medical view that patients with chronic Lyme disease often have no evidence of Lyme disease, so therefore they don't get treated. This is what uh, some people call protecting the patient or patents and not patients. And this all ties into the Lyme disease vaccine, which uh, Al Steer was heavily involved with. Uh, he actually led the research effort for the Lyme race, which was a uh, GlaxoSmithKline vaccine. So Al Steer is famous, famous for saying that Lyme disease is overdiagnosed and overtreated. In other words, it's also hard to catch and easy to cure. This is an interesting, in the New York, interesting article in the New York Times article about Steer, it's called Stalking Dr. Steer Over Lyme Disease. It states, in the realm of Lyme disease, few are as influential as Dr. Steer. Interestingly, a lot of his patients seem to despise him. He says, last year, Dr. Alan Steer, one of the world's renowned medical researchers and rheumatologists, began to fear his patients. Uh, the reason he feared them was because he wouldn't treat them in a lot of cases. The world's foremost expert on his illness did not believe many of them even had Lyme disease. And he refused to, to treat them with antibiotics, uh, mainly long-term antibiotics. So if the world's foremost expert on a disease doesn't want to treat you for it, what do you do? Well, you can go get a second opinion. Uh, but it, it gets better or worse, depending on your perspective. Uh, due to Steer's influence, insurance companies have refused to pay for continuing treatments for Lyme. Uh, so even if you had a second opinion and the doctor wanted to treat you, a lot of times they'll give you my insurance coverage. And uh, if they're not put out of business, uh, you will have to pay out of pocket. It's happening all over the country, happening to my doctor. So this is a diagram I do have to try to explain, just an overview of how these treatment guidelines are used by the pharmaceuticals and insurance companies to deny uh, patients treatment, and they do it indirectly. So the ph pharmaceuticals companies and the insurance companies would love to be able to tell doctors how to prescribe, because they make a lot of money if they can force a doctor to give uh, patients their drugs. Uh, but that would be too obvious, so they use treatment guidelines. So they can point to the treatment guidelines and say, you know, this is the best evidence, this is what you need to give your patients. Uh, that would be one way to do it, but even that would be a little too obvious. So they've used this so-called third-party strategy, where they fund these third-party groups to draft these treatment guidelines. Um, There's an article by Teresa Fercatus that says, they promote organizations that appear to be spontaneous initiatives and are in reality supported and run by citizens that work for the pharmaceuticals companies. So these third-party groups include nonprofits, and medical societies like the IDSA, um, which have these thought leaders like the steer camp experts and the continuing education groups, and they all point to these treatment guidelines, which allows the pharmaceuticals companies to dictate treatment guidelines kind of on the dotted line and that restricts choice for medical treatment for patients, which ends up translating into money for the pharmaceuticals companies and feeds back into the system and gives them more money to control the entire system. So who benefits from this whole system? Well, Alan Steer and the company he was, or the university he was working for, Yale Corporation, uh, was actually working on a vaccine the whole time he was denying patients uh, antibiotics in the early days of the Lyme epidemic. Um, and he actually, Followed through and led the uh, the field studies on the first Lyme vaccine, the Lyme Rex vaccine. Uh, this was a disaster for patients because it induced the very symptoms it was supposed to uh, prevent. The OSPE vaccine was pulled from the market. Uh, this is an article by Steer stating that the way they developed the vaccine was they had a unique set of uh, serum samples from untreated patients which were monitored throughout the course of the Lyme disease in the late 70s prior to the use of antibiotic therapy for this illness. What he doesn't say is that Steer was one of the main reasons that they didn't have antibiotic theory or antibiotic uh, therapy for the illness. So this allows him and his employer to monitor the immune response of these patients so they can develop a vaccine. He states, only with this set of serum samples is it possible to, to determine how the antibody response to Borrelia burgdorferi develop and change during the various stages of the illness. So they were actually able to watch the immune system over a long period of time so they could map it out and try to mimic it in their vaccine. This is a more recent article explaining uh, this rationale. Uh, if you monitor the immune response directed against uh, multiple spirochetal proteins generated throughout the course of the infection, you can use that information to develop a vaccine. This is a statement by Karen uh, 
Forstner, who is the founder of the Lyme Disease Foundation, she states that uh, we're trying to find answers and the biggest problem is self-appointed gatekeepers like Alan Steer. Well, we now know that Steer is not a self-appointed gatekeeper. Uh, he's a CDC biowarfare epidemiologist and a pharmaceuticals consultant. And he's been wrong from the very beginning of the epidemic. But he's always wrong in the right direction for pharmaceuticals interests. And coincidentally, he's a pharmaceuticals consultant. Um, he's also right in the direction for vaccine research and symptom treatment. So this is a, just a quick overview of the steer camp, some, uh, the steer camp history. So they initially de denied antibiotics work at all against Lyme disease. They stated it was a virus. So they had uh, recommended no antibiotics be given. Then they suddenly switched positions and claimed that antibiotics were nearly miraculous. And therefore, only short courses of antibiotics were necessary. And they still maintain that long-term antibiotics is useless and even dangerous. They can they even call some doctors who administer it, administer the murderers if their patients have to die. Uh, the Klemper study on long-term antibiotics administration did not even administer long-term antibiotics as a part of the steer camp. Um, so these positions have an overarching coherence. They're designed to deny long-term antibiotics administration for Lyme disease, which is often necessary. So these, these steer camp positions have been institutionalized in the infamous treatment guidelines. Uh, lead author was uh, Gary Wormser. They were actually investigated by the Attorney General of uh, Connecticut, Blumenthal, as I mentioned. But curiously, in order to be an expert on Lyme disease, you have to be a member of the so-called steer camp of treatment denial. Uh, this is just a quick overview of some of Steer's publications over the years. This is his paper in 1993 stating that the Lyme disease was overdiagnosed. This is the start of the hard to cure, easy, or hard to catch, easy to cure mythology that's been perpetuated. Uh, this is one of Steer's early virus, uh, early papers from the 70s where he stated that uh, Lyme disease uh, may be caused by a virus. It wasn't that symptomatic treatment only is, in, is advised. This is a common theme throughout the epidemic. This is an article, or a book written by uh, Jonathan Edlow called Bullseye. He states, if the cause of an agent was shown to be a bacterium, then the imperative to treat would be greater. So by calling it a line, or proposing that it was a line virus, this uh, provided them with an excuse not to treat people with antibiotics, because you don't treat viruses with antibiotics. This is another paper that's here published. Uh, this is a non-existing uh, tick vector that he claims was correlated with the Lyme disease epidemic, Exodes damini, and it turned out this species of tick didn't even exist. Again, uh, Dr. Edlow states that the change, in, the change in nomenclature was not without its effect, for it meant that doctors could not legitimately make a diagnosis of Lyme disease in states where the vector was not found. So this was just another excuse for restricting the treatment of Lyme disease. It turned out uh, the species of tick didn't even exist. So Steer and his cohorts have been making a career doing research on a disease that they say pretty much doesn't exist, at least in the long term. Another statement by uh, Steer in a publication in the 70s, he stated that we remain skeptical that antibiotic therapy helps. Of course, it's universally treated with antibiotic therapy now. And again, he says that, uh, this is in 1978, it appears that at this point, that only symptomatic treatment is reasonable. Again, this is the common theme. And this is an article from just several months ago, and Steer is still stating the same, uh, taking the same position. This is a New York Times article. They're claiming that uh, when patients relapse, it's largely due to new infections instead of the relapse. This is the, the big controversy, controversy over Lyme disease, whether it's a relapsing disease due to an ongoing infection. In, in the New York Times article, they state um, that Steer admits that the symptoms, sometimes disabling ones, do linger for months after treatment, treating as many as 10% of his patients. Uh, the doctors do, know not, do not know why, but Dr. Steer said antibiotics are not the answer. So if there's one thing Alan Steer knows, it's antibiotics are not the answer. Uh, this is one of his papers stating that uh, one or two months of antibiotics with doxycycline uh, should be sufficient. And if it's not, then he treats with anti-inflammatory agents. Um, again, with doxycycline, this is Dr. Wormser's paper. Wormser, again, is the lead author of the treatment guidelines. He states that even a single dose of doxycycline uh, can prevent the development of Lyme disease if you're bitten by a tick. So the media just regurgitates this so-called steer camp propaganda. This is a New York Times article stating that uh, basically Lyme disease can be stopped in its tracks with a single dose of antibiotic, which is ridiculous because I don't know of any disease that can be stopped with a single dose of antibiotic, especially one that's the most complicated in the world. 
So I ask, is any statement too absurd for the establishment of IMX bits? Curiously, these uh, doxycycline treatments actually induce so-called round body formation in a quiescence of symptoms rather than a cure, uh, which means the disease can go into remission and appear to be cured only to come back later and wreak havoc. So I ask, why are the world's foremost experts on Lyme disease recommending treatments that are likely to reduce the organism to form a protective cyst? and thereby, thereby cause a relapsing, undetectable, and possibly incurable form of disease. So this is a uh, summary statement from Dr. Ed Masters uh, on the history of errors made by the, stock, by, by the uh, steer camp. He states, uh, first off, they said Lyme disease was a new, new disease, which it isn't, it wasn't. Then it was thought to be viral, but it isn't. Then it was thought that serum negativity didn't exist, which it does. Then they thought it was easily treated by short courses of antibiotics, which it sometimes isn't. Then it was only the Exodes damini tick, which we now know is not even a separate valid tick species. So Masters goes on to say, if you look throughout history, almost every time a major dogmatic statement has been made about, we know, about what we know about this disease, it was subsequently proven wrong or underwent major modifications. So what do all these errors have in common? They're right, or they're wrong in the right direction. They effectively justify symptom treatment only for Lyme disease, which is what Alice Deere has been uh, proposing since the early 70s. So these policies, I claim, are uh, tailor-made to make the disease very difficult to diagnose, uh, very dangerous to treat for doctors, and very expensive to treat for patients. Uh, this is, again, a Wikipedia article stating that although Lyme disease is presented as a symptom, this simple illness by these steer camp experts, uh, it has a multifaceted appearance and nonspecific symptoms. Uh, it's called a great imitator. This makes it a nightmare to diagnose and treat. It can, be, uh, it can masquerade as uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, lupus, Crohn's, etc., etc. So this is a nightmare for patients and doctors, and it's presented as a symptom-minded disease. Uh, but ultimately, it's dominated by the pharmaceuticals industry and consultants. And it's also dominated by biowarfare experts, and it's uh, being used as a vaccine development effort coordinated by biodefense institutions and researchers. Yeah, I'm going to skip to the uh, vaccine part of the talk. Okay, so this is the uh, Lyme Okay, I believe the whole tri treatment denial uh, scenario is actually orchestrated uh, to favor symptom treatments over root cause treatment and vaccine development and vaccine marketing. Again, Steer led the, uh, not only the early investigation into Lyme disease from the 70s, but all the way into the 90s. He led the first uh, field trials for the Lyme rich vaccine. Uh, this is an article by Smith, Klein, Beecham, thanking Dr. Steer for his help in conducting the uh, efficacy trials. They state, in this regard, we are indebted to Alan Steer, whose advice on evaluating the adverse events, especially the serious adverse events, has been invaluable. Steer was an expert on adverse events because he didn't watch a patient suffer from Lyme disease his whole career. Again, this is, uh, the vaccine was developed because they had a unique set of serial samples from untreated patients monitored throughout the course of the disease. And only with this set of serial samples was it possible to watch the antibody response develop. Um, this is Steer's employer was Yale University. This is one of the patents on the OSPE vaccine. This is uh, patent by Smith, Klein, and Beecham on uh, another OSPE vaccine component. This is a statement by Warnser, who's also the lead author for the uh, treatment guidelines, stating that uh, this is the reason you want to monitor patients over a long period of time. Basically, they saw that. Patients who had uh, short-term Lyme disease were able to be reinfected, but patients who had so-called late manifestations did not seem to be reinfected. So it was as if the uh, immune system developed over a period of time with a long-term infection. Uh, so if they could learn what exactly was uh, developing and which immune components were responsible, they could use that in a vaccine. So the longer the patients are infected with untreated Lyme, the more immune they appear to future infections. And this might allow them to mimic uh, natural forms of immunity in a vaccine. Uh, 
Again, this is the Tuskegee rationale which stated uh, if you have a chronic disease such as syphilis, uh, this necessitates a long-term study of the natural history uh, of the disease before the effectiveness of programs uh, for the control of the disease can be evaluated properly, such as uh, vaccines. Again, uh, I think what they're doing is they're making the vaccine look uh, cost-effective compared to an untreated epidemic. I'm going to get more into the details now. This is the uh, the article on the CDC authors, the uh, cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness of the vaccinating against Lyme disease. And I believe this is the so-called blueprint for the steer camp of Lyme disease treatment. Um, this is another article here stating that uh, this is by I'm sorry, this is the Meltzer article again. This was the summary of the article where they state that uh, few communities have average annual incidences of Lyme disease greater than half a percent. But what they found out was that the economic, the economic benefits of the vaccines will be greatest uh, in individuals who have a risk of, uh, or a probability of contracting Lyme disease greater than 1%. So this was a problem. Uh, communities that had half percent probability of Lyme, that was in the high region. And what they needed was uh, communities that had a greater than 1% chance of contracting Lyme for the vaccine to be cost effective. And uh, this is the cost effectiveness formula here on the right that they used. This is another article with a similar title, The Cost Effectiveness of Vaccination Against Lyme Disease. Uh, this was supported by the NIH. And again, their conclusion was the vaccine would only be economically attractive for individuals who have a probability of getting Lyme disease greater than 1%. Uh, again, this is the cost effectiveness formula on the right. And these are some curves on the left which they plot. So on the bottom here you have, this is the probability of getting Lyme disease. Um, and on the left is the, uh, the cost effectiveness of the Lyme disease. So you want this to be low. You want to show that you're saving money by vaccinating against Lyme disease. You can do that, for example, if the vaccine has a long efficacy period. So these are vaccines that are effective from two to five years. So if the vaccine is longer for five years, of course, it's going to save more money than a vaccine that's only effective for two years. Or you can make the vaccine look cost effective by uh, increasing the attack rate of Lyme disease. So this is your probability of getting Lyme disease. So if that goes up, then the uh, cost appears to go down, the cost that you're saving by getting the vaccine. So as the Lyme disease attack rate goes up, the cost effectiveness ratio improves. So What's good, what's bad for the public is good for the lack of the Lyme vaccine marketing strategies. This is a common theme. This is another way they plot in the uh, cost effectiveness. So in this case, you have uh, on the x-axis, you have the probability of getting diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease early. Um, which again, if you're public and you want to be treated and diagnosed for Lyme disease, you want that to be high. This is the cost savings of getting vaccinated against Lyme disease. So you want the zero point is way up here. If you're below that, you're actually losing money. If you're above that, you're saving money by getting vaccinated. So they looked at a case of a half a percent, which is where the article said some communities were back in the 90s. And they looked at uh, doubling that and then tripling that and looked at the cost, the resulting cost savings. So let's look at the half a percent region. So this is. If you have a community which, which, uh, in which the probability of getting Lyme disease is only half a percent, and you have three vaccines going from the one at the top is the cheapest vaccine, and the one at the bottom is the more expensive vaccine. Um, in this case, none of these vaccines are cost effective, but note that as you go, as the probability of uh, getting a good diagnosis for Lyme disease goes up, the cost effectiveness of the vaccine goes down. So again, uh, for half a percent probability of getting Lyme disease, which was a realistic probability in the 90s, um, for any probability of getting diagnosed and treatment, you have no cost savings for a vaccine. So all these, uh, all these vaccines are in the red here, and they're below the zero line. So none of them actually save money, so you can't market it. So what's good for the public, high probability of getting diagnosed is bad for vaccine, for vaccine marketing. So again, let's look at the same curve. Now we'll go from, we're going to double or increase by 100% the probability of getting Lyme disease, which is bad for patients. But look what happens. These curves get pushed up 
And now the, the cheapest vaccine is actually made to look cost effective. So the cheapest vaccine becomes cost effective unless the uh, probability is of uh, getting diagnosed is very high. So what's good for vaccine marketing is bad for the public. So let's triple the probability of getting Lyme disease again. So now we're 500% above where we started out. It was over here at uh, half a percent. So now we're 3% chance of getting Lyme disease, which is of course horrendous for the public. But look what happens, these curves get pushed up. And now all three vaccines are now made to look cost effective. So the cost savings per case of version goes positive for all three vaccines from the cheapest to the most expensive with a 500% increase in the probability of contracting Lyme disease. So if you have a low probability of getting Lyme disease, all three of these vaccines can be made to look cost effective. Only in the very, uh, if you have a 90% like chance of getting diagnosed and treated, the most expensive vaccine will look uh, not cost effective. So what's good for Lyme patients, again, is bad for uh, vaccine marketing. So if you're interested in a steer camp the vaccine marketing agenda, uh, you benefit if the probability of Lyme disease is high. We went from half a percent to 3%, so that's a 500% increase. And if the probability of getting diagnosed and treated is low, all three of these vaccines can be made to look cost effective. So I believe this is the blueprint for a so-called steer camp of Lyme disease and the disastrous policies that have resulted. Um, again, this is the Meltzer article which states that the probability of contracting Lyme disease is the most important factor in determining the economic benefit of vaccinating against the disease. Again, they went from half a percent to over one percent to make the vaccine look cost effective. So except for a few isolated areas, uh, the probability of contracting Lyme was far higher than was actually, actually true in reality. So they needed Lyme disease rates to go up. So I asked, were CDC policies put in a place to correct this? I believe they were. And were CDC trained epidemiologists such as Alan Steer put in place to justify these disastrous treatment denial policies to make the vaccine look cost effective as outlined on the CDC publication? And I believe they were. And I believe this is the result. So these are some of the articles I showed up front showing that this summer was one of the worst articles, or one of the worst summers for Lyme disease in history. And again, the, uh, the rate is actually 10 to 50 times higher than what the doctors in the field are reporting, sorry, than what the official uh, statistics are saying. So doctors in the field are confronting an epidemic which is being unreported or underreported in the official statistics. And this is again international cases in the UK have tripled since these articles uh, were written. And again, remember they, in the cases they've been analyzed, uh, they look at tripling the Lyme disease rates. Uh, so they basically designed, defined the disease out of existence in order to get these rates sky high to prevent uh, any public any effective public health measures against the disease. This is an article from the Washington Post uh, a few months ago. This is a woman, a writer, stating that uh, her husband got Lyme disease and her doctor diagnosed chronic Lyme disease in her husband, but many experts say it doesn't exist because they've defined it out of existence. Um, he was treated with long-term antibiotics and got better and better, just like I did. And again, this is another article showing that uh, getting diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease is very controversial have a very difficult time getting treatment for it. And as a result, uh, only 2% of the doctors in Ground Zero in Connecticut are willing to treat the epidemic. Uh, this is another article on the cost effectiveness uh, of the Lyme disease vaccine, and they state um, that the vaccine is only cost effective in individuals who live in areas where Lyme disease is endemic, and for people who are frequently exposed to ticks, and guess what? That's exactly what's going on. This is an article from a few months ago stating that ticks in the Cape, uh, Cape Cod area are sky high. It's actually shutting down recreation areas. Again, uh, campsites are being closed. From the UK to Texas, uh, finding out that, that the prevalence rates in the ticks are higher than, than were claimed by the experts, and that there are actually more tick species spreading Lyme disease than the experts would admit. 
So we have a CDC study which spelled out the uh, cost savings of vaccination against Lyme disease treatments. Uh, the inputs included the following, the cost of the vaccination, the probability of contracting the disease, uh, the cost of successfully treating uh, either the early symptoms or the late symptoms, and uh, the, problem, uh, the probability of the disease disseminating. So in other words, the article re reveals how a business case could be made to offset the uh, costs of a very expensive Lyme disease vaccine if the probability of contracting the disease increases and the cost of treating the disease increases, the probability of correctly diagnosing the disease decreases and the probability of effectively, effectively treating the disease decreases and correspondingly the probability of uh, developing short long-term complications uh, actually increases. So I propose that this CDC article is actually uh, gives us insight into the guiding principles behind the uh, so-called Lyme disease cartel, which is largely managed by CDC epidemiologists, and it therefore provides an understanding of the real goals behind the disastrous policies advocated by the so-called steer camp of Lyme disease. So the policies advocated by this steer camp that have resulted in uh, pain for Lyme disease victims represents gains for vaccine interests. This is a little try to bait up showing the article I just showed um, states that if you increase the probability of contracting the disease, you make the uh, vaccine marketing argument better. And if you increase the cost to treat without uh, vaccines, you make the marketing argument look better. And uh, if you increase the apparent effectiveness of the vaccine, which is what they did when the Lyme Ridge vaccine came out, you make the marketing argument look better. And these are all uh, positions that are consistent with the steer camp of Lyme disease, which spreads misinformation about the vectors and the prevalence and the symptoms, spreads, uh, exaggerates the effect of the vaccine and treatment, and thereby, uh, with all this misinformation, increases the probability of sequela due to the early and late disseminated infection, and they've also reduced the number of doctors available to treat the disease through these treatment guidelines. So one of the ways we're doing this is denying the uh, level of tick infestations in various states. Um, and the treatment guidelines, as I said, are used to deny the treatment and put doctors out of business, even if, if people come back uh, with a positive Lyme disease test. And the state medical boards are used to punish the dissenters. So one of the ways they do this is they have the uh, various epidemiologists from the CDC uh, in this bio-warfare group within the CDC called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And it's their job to infiltrate the state agencies and determine whether uh, illnesses that break out are due to bio-warfare agents. But as a measure of their influence, this is an article stating that in the year 2000, 43% of state and territorial epidemiologists were EIS graduates. So that's almost half of the state epidemiologists are members of this uh, subgroup of the CDC, which is specializing in biowarfare, which allows them to coordinate policy and help put doctors out of business. So I believe this is an article I published uh, two summers ago in the public health alert stating that they're actually conducting a biological warfare experiment on American citizens and it has resulted in uh, spreading an epidemic. Anybody happen to read this article? You can see it online. And I call this the institutionalization of biological warfare because they can control the response to an epidemic through these treatment guidelines and therefore uh, prevent people from getting treated for it and wage, effectively wage biological warfare through treatment guidelines. So interestingly enough, interestingly enough the author of this article that I've gone over, uh, the CDC cost effectiveness article, has presented at uh, EIS conferences, so there's a good chance he is an EIS agent, just like uh, Alan Steer. And in addition to authoring this article on this uh, how to make a vaccine appear cost effective, he's also written an article entitled, entitled The Economic Imp Impact of the Bioterrorist Event. So we have yet another CDC biowarfare expert involved in Lyme disease vaccine policy. Just like Gary Wormser, who is uh, the lead author of the infamous IDSA treatment guidelines, he also has written on uh, bioterrorism. This is one of his articles. Uh, so I said, what's wrong with this picture? If you have the lead on, author on treatment guidelines for a disease which is widely recognized to be a biowarfare agent, is also a lecturer on biowarfare. 
This is one of his uh, video lectures. Again, lead author of treatment guidelines is also talking on uh, how to treat uh, biowarfare outbreaks, in this case anthrax, which turned out to be a leak from the biowarfare facility. So the pharmaceuticals industry has the clout to uh, use the biowarfare infrastructure as a perpetual profit center. For example, they can create pathogens and develop profitable symptom treatments, and they can dominate the approval process for uh, symptom treatments, and then mandate treatment through these treatment guidelines, and then use the treatment guidelines to facilitate uh, the development of vaccines, and then enforce the vaccines through treatment guidelines, and these vaccines can actually perpetuate more symptoms, and the whole process can start over again. So this is a hypothetical situation I've outlined here. Just for the case of argument, it's possible that uh, if you created such a path, pathogen, you could uh, expose people to the pathogen through either an accidental release or deliberate experimentation and prevent people from getting treated for it while monitoring the immune response, uh, developing the vaccines or other countermeasures and testing this vaccine on an increasingly large population, which can be used to market the disease. Um, meanwhile, you're downplaying the complexity of the symptoms, allowing the epidemic to spiral out of control, making a vaccine that's secure more necessary. And then, in the end, you can suddenly admit the true nature of the epidemic, and oh, by the way, we have this vaccine, which now looks cost-effective. So all this, let's go back a step. All this was coordinated by uh, the CDC and their Epidemic Intelligence Service in conjunction with uh, private medical societies like the IDSA and leading academic institutions such as Yale in the case of Lyme disease. And it's facilitated by the revolving door between the pharmaceuticals industry and government, for example. It's an article stating that uh, former CDC director is now leading the Merck vaccine effort. So they have a well-oiled machine ready to implement such a scenario. I'm not sure how much time I have left. I'll just keep going until somebody stops me. Back up a little bit here and discuss, so discuss how Lyme disease is, is, is this incredibly complex infection and yet it's made uh, to look like it's hard to catch and easy to cure by people who are actually making a living off of it. So why is there this deadly oversimplification of such an incredibly complex disease? Again, this is the article in which I state that they're actually conducting a biological warfare experiment by uh, defining the like, chronic stages of the disease away. Again, Gary Wormser, who's the lead author of the so-called treatment guidelines, is also a bioterrorist expert. And Actually, on these IDSA treatment guidelines, over 20% of the authors are biowarfare researchers. We have Gary Wernzer himself, the lead author, who actually uh, lectures on biowarfare and led a disastrous vaccine effort for Lyme disease. We've got Alan Steer, author of the Steer Camp, who is a CDC biowarfare specialist through the EIS group, and he also led a Lyme disease vaccine, which was a disaster. And we have Mark Klentner, who's also an author, who actually directed the biowarfare lab at Boston University. So for a disease that's hardly to catch and easy to cure, there sure are a lot of biowarfare experts associated with defining how to treat it, or how not to treat it. So again, this is Wormser, uh, so lead author of the IDSA guidelines, writing an article on how to treat the anthrax attack, which happened in the wake of 9-11. Uh, he recommends long-term combination antibiotic therapy, which is exactly what the Lyme disease doctors recommend for Lyme disease, but this is not what Wormser recommends for Lyme disease. And this so-called setting of bioterrorism actually was a leak from a U.S. biowarfare facility. This is an article uh, from a year or so ago showing that the U.S. government actually had to pay victims of the anthrax leak in the wake of 9-11 because uh, it had come from the U.S. biowarfare lab this is a Wikipedia article showing that the uh, anthrax bug was identical to the army strains, which was leaked somehow out of a U.S. biowarfare bio facility. Uh, this is a New York Times article stating that uh, a lot of the, 
people in the biowarfare community doubted the official story of how um, the lone nut was uh, supposed to have released this agent into the public. And they staged, they, um, they suspect that this is part of a vaccine agenda. And they say, they state that many people were refusing the inoculations, the anthrax vaccine, the vaccine's manufacturer was shut down. Uh, people were correlating the Gulf War syndrome with uh, the anthrax vaccines. So they state, uh, such an attack would in a single stroke eliminate the skepticism and second guessing about the need for an anthrax vaccine, which is exactly what happened. So now, not only are they, are they continuing to administer the vaccine, but they're extending the testing to children. This is an article stating that uh, the federal advisors have decided to endorse testing of the anthrax vaccine in children, even though it exposed healthy children to substantial harm with no possibility of benefit, according to one doctor. So we have a case of the anthrax vaccine where you have uh, vaccine politics and you have uh, a pathogen leak from a biowarfare facility aiding a vaccine effort. Is uh, Lyme disease also such a case? Well, as it turns out, this is the paper that uh, made Willie Bird Northrup famous. He's the uh, namesake of Lyme disease. Uh, this was in Science Magazine. This is authored by both Willie Bergdorfer and Alan Barber. Curiously, Willie Bergdorfer was working in a biowarfare lab when he discovered Lyme disease and uh, sub subsequently became a bio uh, military epidemiologist. Alan Barber now directs a biowarfare lab and was just awarded a live vaccine contract last year. This is from my presentation last year showing uh, Bergdorfer at work in the 50s in the Rocky Mountain Labs, which is a biowarfare vaccine development lab. Just showing the bird at the lab bench infecting ticks with various disease agents, including Borrelia. So we have the namesake of Borrelia burgdorferi uh, in 1982, whose article was published back in the 1950s. You have uh, Borrelia uh, conjoined with the name of burgdorferi, or, or with uh, burgdorferi, I should say. He was also feeding ichidid ticks with uh, various pathogens, and ichidid ticks were the ones that were found in the 1970s, uh, infecting people outside of a biowarfare lab. So this is uh, from the blog of Under Our Skin, a movie about Lyme disease. And they state that they were actually interviewing Willie Bergdorfer, and they got a, a knock on the door, and it turned out to be somebody from the Rocky Mountain Labs who stated, uh, I've been told that I need to supervise this interview this comes from the highest levels. There are things that Willie can't talk about. So why can't Willie Bergdorfer talk about the disease that's named after him? Um, did any of Willie Bergdorfer's ticks make it to Plum Island? So how much time do I have to assume? Uh, about uh, three minutes. OK. So I'm just going to go quickly over uh, the curious disease distribution. This may explain why Willie Bergdorfer is not about not allowed to talk about the disease named after him. Uh, this is also on the internet under an article called uh, Where Did Lyme Disease Come From? So this is Plum Island Animal Disease Research, which is a biowarfare lab off the coast of Long Island that did tick research. This is Old Lyme, Connecticut, where Lyme disease first uh, broke out in the 1970s. Curious. This is a book written by uh, Michael Carroll called Lab 257. He was one of the first ones to postulate that Lyme disease and other pathogens had broke out from this lab and was causing infections starting in Lyme and spreading out all over the country. So I just went to the internet, to the CDC website, and got the surveillance statistics for Lyme disease. Uh, these are the county statistics. And I just picked the middle region here from 1997 to 2001. So these are the uh, top 10 counties for Lyme disease in the United States. And I just plotted them on big maps. And you can see the distribution here should be sky high. The only article I found was this one. And curiously, they cut off the eastern part of Long Island, right where Palm Island would be. So I found that kind of interesting. But we can go back and look at uh, official CDC maps back into the mid-90s. Right in the center, the, the red zone is the hot zone, where the highest cases are, highest incidence rates are. And Palm Island is right smack in the middle of that. This is the late 90s again, Plum Island right in the middle of the, uh, the red zone. And 
a decade later, Plum Island, right in the middle of it. Uh, so this is a statement by Michael Carroll stating that um, not only Lyme disease, but three infectious germs appear to have broken out uh, from the same area, which is Plum Island, including not only Borrelia burgdorferi, but West Nile virus. And this is a New York Times article stating that West Nile actually did not originate with a mosquito. The first cases were looking from the syringe of a researcher at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. This is an article I wrote back in early 2001 before this New York Times article came out showing that a researcher named Chester Southam was injecting people with West Nile virus and plotting the immune response at that one result. I wrote letters to the New York Times and they finally picked up and wrote an article about this. Uh, but this is all part of a cancer vaccine effort. They were actually injecting people with tumor cell suspensions trying to uh, determine what the antibody response was so they could develop a cancer vaccine. So they did this tumor transplant research in mice, and they just replicated that in human beings. They injected people with cancer so they could monitor uh, how the tumors would grow and actually measure them and plotted them and published the results. And shortly before AIDS broke out, they were even injecting simian tumor viruses and monitoring the lesions that would break out. And this is the SD40 virus, the uh, monkey cancer virus that they injected in people and actually tabulated and published the results um, so they could compare the uh, infected and non-infected uh, cancer cell growth in people by measuring the nodules that would grow. Um, so back to Plum Island, uh, it has a history of safeguard issues, uh, power failures, and they've even, had, um, they've even had disease outbreaks on two different occasions, but they claim the diseases never came off the island. Uh, but curiously, we have this epidemic of various diseases that surround the island. And consistent with that, the uh, viral worker pathogen leak is this article that states that um, there's a clone of Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, which is highly pathogenic, and they state that uh, this clone has dispersed rapidly and widely in the recent past and likely continues to contribute to the rise of Lyme disease incidents. So I wonder where this clone came from um, and how recent it really did uh, arrive on the scene. Uh, people were, or companies have been patenting pathogenic Borrelia strains for vaccines. And this is an article published uh, stating that the uh, phylogeography of Borrelia burgdorferi and its tick vector, the Exodes tick, appear to be unrelated. They state that the evolutionary and biogeographic history of Borrelia burgdorferi does not reflect that of its tick vector. So it's almost as if the Borrelia agent and the tick vector were merged artificially in the lab. Well, curiously, we have Willie Burgdorferi shown here in the lab. Um, he's the namesake of Borrelia burgdorferi. And he was injecting uh, Borrelia in various tick species back in the 1950s, long before the disease broke out, which was named after him. And he was even, even feeding ichthyid ticks in the lab. So there is a precedent for people doing experiments with ichthyid ticks and Borrelia agents, uh, sort of back in the 50s, and decades before Lyme disease broke out, just outside of another biowarfare lab. So maybe this is why Willie Burgdorfer can't talk about the disease that's named after him without supervision from the managers that is. So I'm not saying necessarily that Willie Burgdorfer invented Lyme disease, but what I am saying is that uh, relapsing Borrelia disease agents were being experimented with in biowarfare labs charged with vaccine development by people like Willie Burgdorfer. And Willie is not allowed to talk about the nature of his research. An epidemic of Lyme disease caused by such a relapsing Borrelia disease agent is centered around a different biowarfare lab that does vaccine research on Lyme. And treatment for the epidemic is, has been under the control of military vaccine proponents and institutions from the time of its discovery. And the treatment protocols are ideal for developing and marketing the vaccine, as I described. And it's all been enabled through the so-called steer camp of Lyme disease. I guess I'll stop there.